morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, so, kind of, kind of talked about today's subject a little bit in Sabbath school, and um, the song really fits um, our discussion, our study today. And today we're gonna keep going through the book of Daniel. So far, we went through chapter one and chapter two. And if you remember, in chapter one, we had the story of these four boys who got taken from their home in Judea and were captive into a, a foreign land full of temptations and idolatry. But they purposed in their hearts that they were going to remain faithful to God. And because of this, God gave them wisdom and understanding. Well, in Daniel 2, we get to a point where that wisdom comes in handy, where this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream. And so Daniel interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And the dream goes... Uh, summarized like this. There's a head of gold, and that represents Babylon. There's a chest and arms of silver that represents the per Median Persian Empire. Uh, belly and thighs of bronze represents the Grecian Empire. Legs of iron, the Romans. Feet of iron and clay, the divided Roman Empire. And essentially what Daniel, or God, is telling Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel is that, Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is not going to last forever. Your kingdom is not all that you think it is. And that my kingdom is the one that will reign forever. And the lessons of the book of Daniel in every chapter are both prophetic and practical. And they teach us how to live and be faithful in the last days. And Daniel 3, if you would turn there with me in your Bibles, gets back to the historical chapters of the book of Daniel. So it's going to be a story. And there is a rich blessing in the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, I prefer their Hebrew names because, you know, these are people too. They probably would prefer to be called that. But if I say either, either or, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again for gathering us together, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the scriptures and for the book of Daniel, a book for our time, Lord. Please just help us, Lord, to glean the beautiful lessons from here and this uh, wonderful example of these three men. Uh, Father, we just pray that you would uh, strengthen us and bless, it, bless us and help us focus. We thank you, Father, and ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. Okay. So starting in verse 1. Iggy's there. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Durga, in the province of Babylon. So already we got something fishy going on. What's, what's this image of gold? Because in Daniel 2 we had an image, but it was multifaceted of, of metals. And I think it's interesting that the dimensions of this, this uh, statue is three score cubits, or 60 cubits, by six cubits. And if I understand correctly, the width and the length are, are the same size if the if the length is not listed. So it's 60 by six by six. This should make our ears prick up a little bit, and we'll come back to that later. And six is the number of man. So on the sixth day, God created man, right? So that's the number of man. It's kind of prideful and selfish. So let's get more into what Nebuchadnezzar's got going on here in verse two. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providences, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providences were gathered together to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So it's getting fishier and fishier. You have everybody that's anybody coming to this, this big gathering for the dedication of the image. So far, it, that's all it tells us. They're there to dedicate the image. And if you remember in Daniel 2, there's four Hebrew boys that fall in the category of all these governors and counselors. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they too would have had to been present. But uh, just for whatever reason, Daniel is not mentioned in this chapter. And we can have a, a sanctified imagination and imagine that Nebuchadnezzar sent them somewhere away because he didn't want them to deal with the situation we're about to get into. So 
What message is Nebuchadnezzar trying to send by making an image of all gold? I would say he's making a presumptuous, prideful statement that, you know, my kingdom, Babylon, is going to last forever. There's no divisions and there's no ending. And he's about to be humbled by God. So verse 4. Then in Herod cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So now the cat's out of the bag. They, they got them all gathered there for the dedication of the image, for them to worship it. And when it uses the term, fall down and worship, I can't help but think of Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, where, where Satan tells Jesus, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So it's ultimately Satan behind this power of Babylon. And this command was exclusively for the Jews, because they would have been breaking one of the Ten Commandments by bowing to an idol. So they, Nebuchadnezzar may have already figured that some of the Jews wouldn't be for it. Maybe the other pagan captives or whatnot may not have such a big issue bowing down to a pagan, pagan idol. But this was directly towards God's people, this command. And continuing in verse 7, so that's, there's a commandment to serve this image, to bow to it, and we'll see what happens. Therefore, at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that the king had set up. Can you imagine the intensity of this atmosphere, where you probably have thousands of people gathered on this big open plain, and you got drums, doop, 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 and then trump, and you just, the intensity of the atmosphere would draw you in to worship and to, to be, you know, like we were talking about earlier, peer pressure. Everybody else is doing it. So everybody fell down and worship, every Jew, except three, three men. Verse 8, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So here we got an issue. The, a lot of people were taken captive from Jerusalem, and the, only three of them stood up for God and were convicted. And they were, they were faithful and refused to bow down. And the king is not too pleased with this response we're going to see in verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready... That at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye not worship, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So first of all, he's, he's kind of giving them a second chance. It's like, okay, maybe you didn't hear the commitment. And so if you're ready, I kind of like you guys. I know you're friends of Daniel's, and you guys are pretty smart. So I'm going to give you another shot. And then he does something very foolish, and he challenges the God of heaven. And then maybe uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, hearing this, they knew it was over, that they were going to be okay, because this king had to go run his mouth towards God. And he says, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, this is not the first instance of a pagan king uh, challenging God in the Bible. We read in Exodus about Pharaoh, and in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, Pharaoh says, Who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. And what happened with him? His whole country was decimated. His whole people fled. Also, King Sennacherib in the book of Isaiah and Chronicles and Kings, 
he comes to Jerusalem, he sends an ambassador to besiege it and to, to conquer it because Hezekiah isn't paying him tribute anymore. And this is what Sennacherib says. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. So Sennacherib is implying that God was deceiving the people. Well, that didn't work out well for Sennacherib either. It's actually kind of funny. In history, we have a, a little like clay tablet or a stele where Sennacherib describes his trip to Jerusalem. And he says, I had, I had Hezekiah like a bird in a cage, but he didn't conquer Jerusalem. So where's that part of the story? Well, he probably didn't include the part where the angel of the Lord decimated his army, killing a couple hundred thousand, and then he went back home with his tail between his legs. And so whenever a king or anyone challenges God like that, it doesn't usually end well. But we're going to see throughout this chapter and the next chapter that God is really working on this pagan king's heart for whatever reason. And what is going to be the response of these three boys now that they've been given a second chance to obey the command of the king? Well, verse 16 through 18 of Daniel 3. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. My first impression of this is just, wow. You know, what faith and what loyalty to God. Um, he tells them that we're not, when, he, when they say we are not careful, they're not being arrogant or but they're sick. it's more of a legal term. We have no reason for defense. You've already made your command, and you know you know what we believe, so we have no need to argue with you. So how were they able to stand in such an hour of trial like this? It is very likely that the four Hebrew boys taken captive were well-educated, and because it says they were of nobility, they were descendants of the King David, and they, they may have been personally taught by Jeremiah and Habakkuk. We know that Daniel was very familiar with the prophecies of Jeremiah, and um, Isaiah was only 100 years before. They had a lot of scripture at their disposal. So here are some scriptures that I would imagine these boys had hid in their heart so that they would not sin against God. Job chapter 5, verse 19. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, and seven there shall no evil touch thee. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, verse 2. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And lastly, my, probably my favorite chapter of the Bible, Isaiah 43. And this comes from verse 2 of that chapter. I, I believe, without a shadow of doubt, this scripture, they were thinking of it during this time. And it reads, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. They had this in mind, and they are ready to face death. And I love their attitude of, God, God can deliver us, but if not, that's his business. That's his business. So let's keep reading in verse 19 of Daniel 3. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it wanted to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose in their hats, and their gar other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, 
Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. So who is the Son of God? This is Jesus. This is what we would call a Christophany in the Old Testament, that apparition or appearing of Jesus. And just like Isaiah 43, verse 2 said, God was with them through the fire. So verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was in hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Can you imagine that? You sit, you sit around a campfire and you, you smell like smoke for two days. But they were in the middle of a furnace, no singed hair, nothing. And God really preserved them to the max. And can you imagine what a witness? It says all these governors and princes and captives came. What a witness these young men have been in their 20 years of battle. First with Daniel interpreting the dream and, and now with this, seeing the great power of the God Jehovah. So verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's words and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. So because of these men's faithfulness, they were delivered. This story is very layered and very deep. And in this whole 24-hour Sabbath period, we would not be able to peel back all the, all the layers. Oftentimes I like to say the Bible is like a, the biggest onion you've ever seen. And it just keeps... Keeps getting deeper and deeper. But I, I will talk more about Nebuchadnezzar in our next study, so I'll leave it at that. But we can see a change happening in his life. And in chapter 4, we'll see the climax of that. And so getting back to our story, the two P's of Bible study for me are the practical and the prophetic. So with any story, I like to think about that. How has this practically helped me? How has this practically helped the church? And how does it deal with prophecy in the end times? So let's start with the practical. What helped get these Hebrew boys through the situation? That's what we're. That's what the question is. And we kind of talked about it in Sabbath school. The trials and the, the sufferings is what strengthened them and what strengthened their faith. They were already in a foreign land. They were already castrated and, and ridiculed and exiled. And so for them, this, this may, may have been small potatoes as to what they've already been through. And so we've got to keep that in mind that when God's, you know, allowing these things to happen, that it's for our benefit. Disaster, tragedy, and heartbreak lurk around the corner of every good day. And we often wonder why. Why would God allow, I want that key word, allow these things to happen? Because God's attitude towards us is not disaster and heartbreak and and disease and sickness, but he does allow those things for his glory and for our benefit. So let's look at some scripture in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And it was our scripture for today. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, or the priests. The Bible says we are a nation of priests. And purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And so this Bible uses this imagery of refining gold and refining metals. And so I did a little research as to how ancient gold or ancient metal was refined and purified. And this is what I found. Refining with flame is one of the oldest methods of refining metals. 
In ancient times, this form of refining involved a craftsman sitting next to a hot fire with molten gold in a crucible being stirred and skimmed to remove the impurities or dross that rose up to the top of the molten metal. They oftentimes also would beat, beat the metal, beat, 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 until almost like a pancake. And then they'd put it in the, in the kiln or in the crucible to melt it. And as it was heated up to extreme temperatures, the impurities would rise and they would skim it off the top. And then you would have a pure product. And I love how God uses this imagery for our walk and growth in faith. And that's, just, that's the reason why he allows the same beating and he holds us to the fire. Sometimes literally, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but sometimes in our own trials, in our own fiery furnaces. And he wants us to be like gold. It is not God's desire to inflict pain or punishment, but he uses these things. I like to think of Job, probably one of the greatest examples of suffering and patience in the Bible. You know, he didn't do nothing wrong, but God allowed him to be tested, to test his faithfulness to him, and to see, Job, how are you going to act, you know, when, when push comes to shove, and life isn't always pretty. And Satan really lays it on Job. He kills his family, he kills his sheep, he puts boils all over his body where he's scratching himself with a cast iron pan. And, and what his wife tells him is, is Job, curse God and die. And you know what Job says? Though he slay me, I will bless him. And that's the attitude we need. And think of Jesus. Jesus who suffered more than anyone. And he took it, he took it as joy. He took it as joy. Because he knew that's what was going to get us back together. Some scriptures um, about the refining process. Proverbs 25 verse 4. Take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth the vessel for the fire. Isaiah 48 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. So God sometimes puts us through that furnace of affliction. And it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. First Peter, uh, a lot of verses here in First Peter, I'll just read them together. So First Peter 1, 7, 4, 12, and 13. And Peter really expounds on this. And it puts the, the two and two together. Faith and the fire and the trials. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Beloved, think it not a strange thing concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange, strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So Peter tells us that sanctification is kind of an ugly process sometimes, it's grueling, but it does have a beautiful result. As when you see that molten gold, you don't think nothing of it. But then when it's turned into a beautiful, shiny gold bar, it's, it's worth looking at. And that's what God wants to do with us, is to purify us, to take out the impurities. And just like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, God is with us through the furnace. Through the furnace. He doesn't just leave us to our own. So Zechariah 13, verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. And I'm going to read it again, Isaiah 43, verse 2. This is something we should put in the back of our brains. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall a flame kindle upon thee. And probably also one of my favorites is Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Matthew. He tells the disciples to teach them, to teach, teach the, the people they're going to witness to, to observe all things, whatever he has commanded them. And Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. And God is faithful in his promises, so you can take that to the bank. And whenever we're feeling discouraged, we know that we have an advocate and a friend and a brother up in heaven working on our behalf. Oftentimes we don't understand why bad things happen. You know, just, just recently, you know, a lot of this COVID stuff, you know, it affects everyone different. And 
unfortunately, some people, it happens quick. And, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a little bit of disbelief over our brother in Aurora, you know, because I was very quick, and I just seen this brother not too long ago. And that's, you know, that's the world we live in. But God allows those things for his glory. Just, we can think back to Joseph and his brother selling him to slavery and doing all these evils to him. And what he says is, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. That many this day would be saved. And I believe he's talking to Satan right there. And, you know, through, you know, adversity, trials, even death, God is glorified. And, and you know, it makes me think about my mortality and my need of Christ and how I need to be purified. So we have a, I wrestled for about 10 and a half years. And in the sport of wrestling, there's a saying called embrace the grind to embrace it. And wrestling is one of the most grueling and, and difficult and taxing sports there is. You, you're up in practice five days a week, two hours a day with sweaty people and it's humid and it's hot and you're, you're tired and it punishes you. But when it comes competition time, you're ready. And you were taught to embrace that, to, to enjoy it. And I think the same is here. Those wrestling practices were not necessarily fun. They were tough and they were difficult and sometimes painful. But it's the same with our faith. It is tough, it is difficult, but we should embrace it. We should take it with joy that God is refining us, God is working and he's doing things for us and he wants us to be more like him and to save others around us. And now let's get into the prophetic because 10 times out of 10, the practical helps us with the prophetic and how to walk that out. Now this story will happen again in Daniel 3. There will be a time where an empire nation says, you must bow down and serve this image. So I'd like you guys to turn with me to Revelation 13 in your Bibles. It's in the back of your book. So verse 11, we'll start there. And it's talking about some, some things that are coming up here in the near, near future. And I want you guys to listen and read and see if you catch the similarities with this story and the, the story we just read in Daniel 3. So verse 11 of Revelation 13. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised with all power the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, just like Nebuchadnezzar's image, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed or cast into the fiery furnace. Verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or on their foreheads, and that no man might hire sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six six six. And all these these buzzwords are popping off the page to me. Nebuchadnezzar's image was sixty cubits by six cubits by six cubits. They were commanded, all, all these people, the governors, the satraps, were commanded to come and worship. In Revelation, we see all the, all the earth wonders after the beast. The, the second power commands all to worship the beast. But we don't have time for it. But God does have his faithful people, too, in the book of Revelation, that refuse to worship the beast. And just to wrap this up, our trials strengthen us and bind us closer to Christ. And they're to, to prepare us for greater trials that are soon to come. Because they will come as long as we're here on this earth. 
and the sin will be purged out of our life, and the Holy Spirit will be able to break, mold, and shape us, just like the gold. Persecution is coming. It is coming. And with persecution comes a refining of the church. In Revelation 2, Jesus says a message to the, the second century church under the Diocletian persecution, the first persecution of the Christians by the Romans. And he tells them, he doesn't say anything bad about them. And he tells them, fear none of those things which thou hast suffered. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So we don't we don't know if we're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if we'll be like John Huss and Jerome, who didn't make it out of the fiery furnace. But they had the same attitude as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that if God will deliver me, praise the Lord. If he won't, praise the Lord. That's his business, and that's the attitude we need. The last two verses. Daniel 12.10, talking about the time of the end that we live in. Daniel says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried or refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And our last scripture, as you might help us to get through all this, Revelation 12.11, And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for these lessons and the scriptures that are written for our admonition, that we may learn and grow by them, Lord. We know, Lord, that this earth is sad and miserable at times, even though there is beauty in it. But the majority of it is, is depressing, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that we would have that joy that only comes from knowing you and being connected to you. And that through adversity, Lord, and through struggles, and through hardships, and through, you know, even death and sickness, that we would look to you, and that we would be a light to others, to point them, that they may wonder, you know, why is so-and-so so happy, you know, their their cousin just died, or whatnot. And, and let us have that hope, Lord, that resurrection morning we'll all be connected, and that, you know, as we, we approach the near end, Lord, that you would give us a strength, that you would help us to submit to you and empty ourselves, and that you would be with us, Lord. And let us remember those promises, Father, that through the waters or through the fire, you are there with us. And when the time of trial comes, you will strengthen us. We thank you, Father, and pray for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.